So what, when I went to the first professional connections conference in the UK, Donald Featherstone passed away and I had three minutes notice to speak about Donald Featherstone and his impact on Morgan. So I had three minutes of preparation. And that made me really think about the connection between professional and hobby wargaming. I think it's been there in plain sight and it's contributed vastly to the art and science of professional wargaming. Now, the importance of professional wargaming has certainly been on the rise in recent years as demonstrated by a whole series of handbooks which have been produced. What's quite interesting is it is not a comprehensive set of handbooks. So where is the American Air Force handbook on wargaming, for example? It's just not there. So there are significant gaps in the theory and practice of professional wargaming. Now, other countries are desperately trying to develop a wargaming capacity. Now, why? Well, part of the reason is best summarised by Colonel McCaffrey. Uh, Colonel McCaffrey started the professional wargaming conferences in the United States in uh, 1993, uh, and has just published a book uh, which has documented the history of professional wargaming. And he best summarises it says, wargaming saves lives. So he has endless case studies where people have practiced things at the tactical operation strategic level and it's then had an impact actually on the conduct of the war. Other countries are desperately trying to develop more game capacity. I particularly like uh, this one, uh, which is in China. Um, I don't really want to say anything more about that one. No, okay. So it was the Chinese, uh, these are maps of the Santos training area and they're practicing a platoon level free creek spiel one side against the other. This is the latest one, which is from the Iranian Journal of Wargaming, uh, in case you don't read it. It's in Farsi, it does have abstracts in English. Now, there are significant gaps in our understanding of professional wargaming. Dunkempf is one of my favorites. Dunkempf was a set of wargaming rules which were based on the WRG Modern Warfare rules. Uh, I've got the letters exchanged between the authors and Phil Barker, who's such as here, for example. Uh, and they were miniature, one in 300 scale, units built models of their training areas or areas they were expecting to fight operations. And they played out things, for example, their exercises uh, before they went out and actually did the exercises or their live firing exercises, they actually played them out on the tabletop first. Uh, so this was really important about 1980 to 1990, and it was last year, it was about 2000, 2010, uh, by some of the American officer training units in their universities, and every unit had a kit of Duncan. But this story sort of got forgotten. Uh, it was only when I actually found the original rules, found many variants of the rules, there was the airborne variant, there was the heavy tank variant, uh, and I realised just how widely this had been used. So this has gone back into the history of war game again, a miniature game used during the Cold War. Uh, the Naval War College rules, for example, 1919 to 1941, have always been held up as the epitome of predictive war gaming. Uh, these were played at the US War College. They were preparing officers to fight largely in the Pacific War. Okay, well, initially they were preparing to fight the Royal Navy, but they changed their minds to fight the Japanese. Um, the only problem with these rules is when I actually played the rules, it came out as very different from the accolades to them. I've just listed a few of the things. So I can actually play the rules and let go of the scenarios. You know, the rules are about long range gunnery jewels, you know, a kind of Jutland just with longer ranges. Uh, uh, what was it? Battles. Most of the battles are actually fought at night. In the war games, obviously they're fought in the day, so you can see what the mods were doing on the floor. The Royal Aircraft, they just had underestimated it. Now, whether fair or not, I tackled this and I talked about this, and it was interesting when I met Norman Friedman in the United States, who knew more about this than anyone else. And he was just fascinated and said, yeah, of course I played with toys on the tabletop. I have I played a game, yeah, haven't I? And show people, I mean, run through the scenarios, I've done so. And actually, I found some major differences. But I still support the contention, although they had many of the details wrong, the key thing is 
it trains flexibility of mind. So when the Pacific War turned out to be different from what they were used to, they were the, used to the idea of some change rules and they adapted more quickly than the Japanese to the changing conditions of war. Now, the scale of hobby wargaming to professional wargaming, the scale of professional wargaming is so tiny, it is ridiculous. Um, I just quite like Games Workshop was valued at a mere £1 billion in 2018, so actually it's now bigger than Marks and Spencer's. Now that is the major British miniature wargaming company. However, there are also very large American board gaming companies and the Euro gaming companies and the computer game companies. So actually professional wargaming is really, really tiny. And the hobby sector involves many different things, uh, apart from miniature games and board games, computer games and role playing games and party games and murder mystery games, whether you can consider LR LARPing as part of it, I don't know. But it, the hobby is absolutely huge. Now, there are connections between two branches of wargaming, but they're largely unreported. So, Matt Caffrey's book, which is the most comprehensive account you could possibly imagine of professional wargaming, it's actually staggering huge. Who's read it? Yeah. Yeah, I've read most of it. Um, I haven't read it. Okay. <laughs> because it's everything is glued in the kitchen sink about professional wargaming. Everything you found out was just popped in there. Um, Hobby games are mentioned four times in this 479 pages. Now, Graham Monty Brown's book, which is the Handbook of <coughs> Professional Wargaming, which is if you're in professional wargaming and you want a you know someone who's had decades of experience in running exercise and things for the army, that's the book to go to. Really super detailed. Well, uh, 125,000 words, uh, 395 of those words at the top devoted to hobby wargaming. Oh, and I wrote those. Um, by the way, the word hobby is used elsewhere in the book, but there's only 400 odd words about hobby wargaming. So I contend that the impact of hobby wargaming on professional wargaming has been underreported significantly. Now, the emphasis on professional wargaming has changed over time. Uh, Peter Perler refers to this as a sine wave with peaks and troughs. I supported this because I was the editor for the second edition, so I thought, yes, John Good Chap was bound to be right. Um, however, I'm starting to see that some of the troughs is because there are gaps in our understanding. We didn't realize what was being done. So in 1979, there were 31 professional war games being used in the United States and Britain and that includes one in France. So by NATO allies, there was one war game going on, and that's the French. Um, first battle, for example, I only discovered, first battle was a divisional level war game from the Cold War. The Chinese, by the way, the Chinese modern military are absolutely fascinated by this. Maybe they're the only people actually with divisions any longer. Uh, and I thought, yeah, this was an interesting novelty. It's very well explained how it's done. But on the US Connections Conference, was it just over a week ago, they had a US general who was saying how first battle was critical and every single United States division tested its plans using the first battle of war game, edited its plans and went round a cycle going round and round and round using this war game. So I'm starting to suspect when there's some of the troughs of war gaming, it's because we just don't know Actually, there was still a lot of gaming going on. But maybe in 10 years' time, we'll be able to say. Now, why did professional wargaming fail to gain traction until very recently? It's had its ups and downs. Well, first of all, wargaming history has been obscure and an incomplete narrative. So if you said to someone in the US Marine Corps, great, let's look at the Vietnam War games. They'd look at you and say, what are you talking about? We haven't got any Vietnam War games. Well, actually, there are some. My publications have found some of the Marine Corps have found some others. Some they found them probably classified them because obviously the thought of Wargaming rules, 1968, amphibious land in Vietnam is clearly a secret subject. Um, but they are slowly emerging. 
but it's really it's been incomplete. So part of the reason professional wargaming has lost public traction, as in like, the senior ranks, they don't think it's important because they can't look back on history and say, pull off the shelf, let's look at the war games which are used on each generation of our military. There's been a lack of training courses. This is just starting to change. Wars in the United States do a really yeah, good training yeah, course. Yeah. Um, I contribute to one hour because they need someone to talk over the lunchtime while they're eating their sandwiches. Um, but they are trying to attempt to train people in the basics of wargaming. There's been few conferences of wargaming. The US, Conf US Connection Conference started in 1993 and carried on because McCaffrey, the major in the US Air Force, was given the order and it was never rescinded. So it's carried on. Uh, but I actually say my wargaming practice only really started to disseminate around the Western world when we actually had the UK Wargaming Conference in 2013. Um, maybe because our conference was just open, maybe Phil Sabin organised it better, I don't know, but to me that was the real takeoff point. There's also been a cult of personality, which is, especially in America, oh no, 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 it can't do war games because this person's not available. No, 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 there's someone from the Central Canadian Houses, if you don't have that person, you cannot possibly run a war game about ships, can you? Because there's no one else in the Western world who knows anything about war gaming. So there has been a real cult personality. And also, some of the war games have about future wars, are full of errors. Uh, this one, for example, Joe Miranda, Joe Miranda, Tom and I were just talking about him, only yesterday, uh, he's been one of the big game designers uh, of the last 30 years, huge number of games. So this one about the Ukraine, for example, it was in 2003, a decade before the actual conflict, um, many interesting features. They actually all that was wrong. I mean, they had Russia invaded with nine divisions. Um, oh, and I quite like this one. NATO responded with armoured divisions. Of course, this is completely ridiculous. And the professional war games, and I've done a presentation about this, have just as many errors in them about future wars. And this could be used by the detractors of wargaming. They pick up a set of rules, or a wargame say, well, do you know what? You've got one thing wrong, therefore the other 99 things clearly must be wrong as well. So I'm going to try and demonstrate that hobby games actually inform the professional or development of professional practice. Now, the first game with political message was actually in 1888. You learn Lieutenant Henry Chamberlain. England was potentially invulnerable to invasion. At least that's what they thought at the time, uh, if anyone was actually interested as in invading. Uh, there's the game board just there. I quite like the optional channel tunnel feature. I couldn't quite decide if we were saying we should have a channel tunnel or we shouldn't have a channel tunnel because it could make us more vulnerable to invasion. You know, lots of French people could sneak onto the trains and they could put divisions through and we would notice. And basically the enemy land in the ports and then you mobilize troops to take them on. So that was the first game with a political message. Interestingly enough, you can't say it really changed the world, but it was at the time when the Victorians built large numbers of forts, they had local militias, they built defensive features. And this game was merely a part of that message, England is invulnerable to invasion. Now, Bella. Bella. Now, Bella was an English Creeksville variant. So we had the original Creeksville, it was continually developed. Uh, for example, the War Office had a version of it. Obviously, it was just before the Boer War. But interesting enough, this version actually changed the game. And what they did was they actually had, instead of just working on a map, you have a cloth marked with two inch squares. Uh, you have the scenery on there with ribbons or you just get an actual paintbrush and you paint on the map, so you can create the terrain of your choice for your game. Um, and they had traditional maps that show the words, yeah, okay. So here is the, the game here. Now, interestingly enough here, they've got a screen in between, and this game was actually developed by civilians who were in the equivalent of the Territorial Army of the time. So the game was run, it could be finished in one training evening, 
you've all played together on one lap, screen in between, at some point the screen would be removed and the situation would be resolved. Now the advantage is that if you didn't have the local maps, you could create the maps of the areas you thought the wars were going to take place, which was actually largely on the southern coast of England. Now Polymos, at 1883, this is a challenge to the view that the first commercial board war game was Tactics in about 1954, because this game went to three editions. It's a war game, absolutely. It's an open game, as in you're all looking at the same table. Uh, you have a cloth, you have books underneath to create your contours. You have wooden buildings to represent buildings. Uh, you have 30 millimeter figures, which is visualization. The hidden strength of it is you have the unit strength is actually hidden, so you allocate that at the start of the game so your opponent, opponent doesn't know uh, with your battalions how strong they are, how many hits they can actually take. So that was a hobby game which was pushing forward what became professional game. Now, there are gaps in our understanding. I quite like this one. The game of old shot, I talk to people about it, I hope that someone's going to say, oh, I know what that is. 1870s, sure, it's just a kid's game, isn't it? Hang on, roads, uh, hills, you said contour lines, uh, three crossing points, villages, a town, is that an urban area? Yeah, obviously an urban area. Um, marsh, to me, that looks like it had moving blocks on it. That is not snakes and ladders, is it? It's not drafts, it's not chess, it's a war game, isn't it? We just haven't got the rules or any of the playing pieces. Now, out there is the Victorian Board Game Collectors Club, who are trying to document and collect the mass of Victorian board games, and they are finding odd war games are popping up. And they talk to me and they send me a copy of them as and when they find and identify and say, hang on, this is a war game. I particularly like, this is later one, this is World War II, and it's the SS Troopers storming the pillbox game. I quite like that one. So, the early naval games, I'm sure you all know, uh, there's three of them, but actually it was Fred Jane who took those concepts into a practical war game, and this practical war game was accepted. This is the classic illustration from the newspaper, uh, this is actually the Portsmouth Wargaming Club. It shows officers and civilians playing, multiple games playing, umpires. Uh, anyone played the Fred Jane War Game? Yeah, it's quite fun, isn't it? Bashing with the sticks, yeah, yeah creating the holes, etc. And the umpires holding up the lights to where you hit the enemy ships. Um, interesting game, but it was civilian who actually pushed it forward. And every time we look, we started to find that the Fred Jane game was more important than we thought before. I'm hoping to publish a book. Uh, it's got the first draft, and it's about early naval, early naval, Royal Naval war games between 1900 and 1915, all from original sources, all of it unpublished material. And that will start illustrating just how important this game was. Now, there are a number of people, war game evangelists, who are in the hobby space who pushed on professional wargaming. This is just my random selection. Obviously, H.T. Wells. Now with H.T. Wells, uh, obviously all of us have laid down before and played with Soy Cannons. It's been done at the Wargame Done Balance Conference many times before. Uh, absolutely, yeah, the toy houses, the cannons. What did he do? Well, he introduced abstractions and generalizations to say, let's make a playable game within an afternoon, which represents warfare. So while the military were either having really complex games, or saying, no, let's dispense with the rules, we don't need that, let's get the umpires to make judgments, he was starting to go for somewhere in between. Donald Featherstone, well, what did Donald Featherstone do? His contribution was several things. His first of all, he helped make wargaming respectable. So his book, War Games, 
put war games out there. And because he was a sergeant, you know, he served in World War II, that put war games, that was, you know, that was, you know, that was a veteran publishing book, and that meant a lot more than it does today. You know, a veteran publishing book is something of automatically given respect. Uh, he also based his war games or talked his war games about war and veterans all the time. The personal accounts, I think it was Phil said this at the first Connections Conference, that Don Fellows was a key contribution. It was full of, you know, let's read the original accounts and try and pick out the important things. We now call this operation analysis. And it's interesting, at the second Connections Conference, I asked who considered themselves an operational analyst and how many of them have played hobby war games and had heard of Donald Featherstone, and it was every single one that played Donald Featherstone's war games and then gone on to a career to operational analysts. Now, Colonel Dupuy. So, Colonel Dupuy produced a very interesting model, the quantitative judgment model. It was a mathematical model that determined combat. He produced tables of advance, attrition rates in combat, things, by the way, which we quote today. Um, they're just, yeah, they're quoted for the base about rates for advance and things. Now, interestingly enough, actually, he had, was inspired, I believe, by hobby games. First of all, he was one of the Fletcher Pratt players. And I wonder whether the Fletcher Pratt equation for determining the ship strength was actually what inspired him to then try and produce a model to determine land combat. But I quite like this one. This is the operational lethality index for aircraft. And then I compared it with Featherstone 1966 in air war games. So Don had a book and one of the chapters was about you create a quantitative value of aircraft. And as the aircraft gets hit, it loses firepower and speed, etc. Uh, hang on, common value of aircraft weapons, total value of weapons in the aircraft, speed, speed, this thing could go into the equation. Punishment factor O. On the weight of the aircraft, points for protective armor, not for the weight of the aircraft. Uh, Seeing effect factor O. Hang on. Dupuy, I think, plagiarized Donald Featherstone. Now, of course, different people who come up with the same ideas at the same time, using the same language. But maybe hobby at war games influenced Dupuy. Now, James Dunningham. Now, James Dunningham is a living legend, like Joe Miranda. He's created more board games than you can possibly imagine. Uh, I quite like Panzer Blitz, and that sold 300,000 copies. I mean, those were the days, weren't they? Oh, how much do we do? Oh, let's do a 200,000 in the first print run, shall we? Uh, do you think I'll be like, okay, let's increase it to 300,000. Um, and he, push forward in board gaming many of the ideas which we use today. Now, interestingly enough, actually, he had a contract from the US military. Uh, it was published in 1976. Uh, well, interestingly enough, actually, I suspect that there was, the, the contract was not quite as rigid as it should have been. So he produced the game for the US military and then probably published it as a hobby game as well. The slight difference was that the, oh, there was very little difference in between the two. Now, notice actually the terrain. So this is meant to be Germany. These are 100 meter hexes. Has anyone got any comments about the terrain? Remember this Germany, West Germany? It's a bit open, isn't it? And this was because the US military edited his game for publication because they, were, they wanted to emphasize the effect of long range anti-tank guided missiles which really hedges and woods and buildings and windmills and telegraph wires, etc. You know, they just all interfere with it, don't they? Or spoil it. So what you do, well, you just strip out the terrain. On the military version of this map, by the way, they removed the swamps at Fort Benning. Um, yeah, so I've seen the map. Uh, now, it's also enough that they removed the morale and they removed the morale from the American units because obviously it was un-American for American units to panic and to combat. So the gin, bless his cotton socks, obviously said, well, in that case, let's take it away from the Russians as well. So there are no morale rules involved. But it's interesting, 
So it's Jim Dunningham, his gaming was informing the US military versions of the games. Uh, now, Paddy Griffith was a senior lecturer uh, at the Royal Military Academy in Santos, 1973 to 89. Don Featherstone had an influence on him getting there because Dave Cardler said, do you know what, we desperately need some people who are specialists in operational and tactical military history. Do you know anyone? And Don suggested someone said, well, I'll think about the young Paddy Griffith. Now, of course, that's not getting him the job, but it helped him get to the interview and we could get the job. So Paddy came out of nowhere to this key job. Uh, I thought he drew would be a good appointment as well for that sort of job, or Richard Brooks would have been very good. Now, he was a hobby war gamer, but his war games bridged the divide between hobby and professional, though I'm not sure the professional realised how much uh, Paddy was bringing in. So this one, the Counter Insurgency Games, he was bringing in role-playing stuff in fact, some of the stuff which then he used at War Game Developments was actually informing this. Now, there are other random examples. I, I quite like this one. Phil Barker, W.R. Sheep Modern Rules. I have got bored looking at Cold War sets of rules, which say in the front, with thanks to Phil Barker, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, yeah, they say it in Duncan in contact and various other classified games which are not published because clearly games from that era, you know, it should be secret, shouldn't it, what a T64 could do in those days. Um, confrontation in the Falcons going book I've just published, it's now been used, so they've lifted some of the games from that with permission uh, for trade games in a couple of well-known countries. Uh, I obviously gave permission because obviously if I hadn't given permission, they would have done it anyway because it had been classified, so I wouldn't get to see it anyway. So all the time, the professional are lifting ideas and concepts from the hobby, but only occasionally do we actually hear about it. Now, some hobby games in the hobby space that have contributed significantly to our development of the understanding of Cold War history. I quite like this example because we have one of the perpetrators that's actually sat in the audience right now. So I was paying Megablix. You never paid Megablix. It's an operational level game and it's all about trucks. So the key thing is to make sure you've got enough trucks going to the right place so you've got enough supplies to keep the war going. So I, I edited the game site, I modified it site for the Cold War early Cold War, and then I realized something. So I got the Russian, I got the American tank division with the trucks on the table like this, the British one like this, and then the Russian one was like this. And I thought, hang on, I've got this wrong. So I looked at source after source after source and realized prior to the Arab Israeli war, they actually had 250 trucks per division to supply it. Uh, in 1980, by the way, they actually increased that to 1,500. So what would have happened up to the mid-1970s, maybe 1978, something like that, if the Russians had attacked, I'm sure they would have done very well, in spectacular, heroic fashion, and then within three days, they would have shot every bullet they had, every round they had, they'd have run out of fuel, the right would have fought. It would have been hopeless. So when I've raised this, a professional war game, they all said, oh yes, yes, we knew, yes, we knew about this, and I say, hang on, I've looked at the journals, the academic journals from this time, none of them say, don't worry about the Russians on the Central Front, because the logistics support is ridiculous. Um, yeah, no one said that at the time, and I've got the war games from the time, which is 1956, British Army war game, and there's subsequent ones, and none of them say, well, this game runs for two days, by the way, and at that point, you can fall over laughing because they'll run out of fuel. You know, they've got their 40 miles into Germany, and that's it. Um, so it's quite interesting that the people from that time who were into that time, yeah, yeah, of course we knew, we just, yeah, right, they just didn't publish it. So it's quite interesting that now I've seen several articles which have referenced this. They haven't mentioned Megablix, they haven't mentioned me, but they're coming out with the same statistics, and I think I know where that came from. So, hobby methodologies that have moved into the professional. 
gosh, we have several people here involved as well. Matrix games, uh, confrontation analysis, and of course, cyber war games. Now, Matrix games, they were invented in the United States by Chris Engel, uh, an innovative thinker, definitely thinks laterally. Uh, he published the idea, but it was only through walking into developments, and a lot of people, no, some of the people here, like Bob, who's not here, or John Armitage, a uh, good one on Saxon, England, published a commercial, no, yeah, Hobby Wargaming magazine, Tim Price and others helped develop Matrix games, but it was only actually when they got published have they taken off, and now Matrix games are absolutely everywhere. They're just being used all over the Western world as narrative gaming. But if you ask them where they came from, and I'd have asked several Americans at the Morse conferences, they said, well, actually, if the Americans invented them, and clearly it was classified. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting, that's very, very interesting, as you said. Yes. But I think from a WD point of view, the high water market matrix game is as much as it is. It was, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, it was, yes. There were endless developments of it, experiments with it, with, uh, yeah, wasn't it? it was just cars, everything else. But it's interesting now, they're now embedded in practice, but already the urban mythology is actually, they came from North America. Um, they're obviously a professional development. And I said, no, actually, it was hobby game development. Yeah, okay. Now, confrontation analysis. So, this was a technique developed in the academic sort of applied in the professional, disappeared because uh, one of the authors of the technique died. The general who liked the technique had the nerve to retire. Um, so it died and actually it was Mike Young who resurrected this technique. And it's a way of analyzing dilemmas and in international confrontations. And now it is, it's out there and now it's back. And someone called John Hanley is doing a lot of work on this in the United States. So, academic, sort of military, hobby space developed back into the professional. Now, cyber war games. Uh, when Tim Price and I wrote this book about cyber war games as a, a sort of a working paper, I thought, great, we'll see an avalanche of people out in the professional space who come up and say, oh, we're doing a lot better. And it turned out there was no one doing it any better. Uh, I've since published a book, The Handbook of Cyber War Games, which was a whole series of exercises done in business and the academic world. Um, and now, interestingly enough, there are professional gaming techniques in cyber which are overtaking these. So this is, this is sort of an introduction. This is sort of chapter one, but there are other chapters being written now by cyber war games out there but it's often been hindered by secrecy. Uh, so in the professional space, if you say, for example, do you know what, we're gonna try and hack a Chinese satellite. Uh, you're not saying how it's going to be done, but you're saying, okay, for game purposes, we're gonna say we a 40% chance of this happening. No, no, the concept of you actually even hacking a Chinese satellite, that is so sensitive, we can't have that in the game. We can't talk about uh, information war operations on, in downtown in Moscow to affect public opinion. Um, but now, there is stuff happening out there. I don't know what's happening out there in the classified space, but I know stuff is sort of filtering through, and there are some clever ideas in there. Now, these are random examples of hobby techniques. There are endless examples, and you can shout out some. Uh, cards with rules, I think probably, SBI counters. So the plot to assassinate Hitler had a suitcase counter, no, a briefcase counter, didn't it? And various counters, you pull them out and then you refer to the rules. Well, that's the prelude to card based rules. So you've got a card with a capability on, so you can't read the whole rule book. There it is. And that was actually from SBI. Step by step game tutorials. Well, perhaps Avon Hill's Starship Troopers, which initially the first scenario is very simple, the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. Whereas all the professional war games I've seen until recently, you've all said, well, here's the 160 page rule book. If you can't possibly play a skirmish scenario without knowing all 166 pages. Uh, Mike, didn't you develop a game which had step-by-step -step tutorials in it? I think so. 
Did strike force have it? Strike. Strike, didn't that? Strike. Yeah, yeah, so I said strike, yeah, so I thought. Marker tracks to show things like morale or production, so abstraction is something to keep track of it so the players can see it. Well, I don't know where exactly that came from, but it's from the hobby space. Force selection to encourage options. Well, if you go back to WRG Ancients, part of the fun of the game is looking at all the different force options and considering what you should include. And the learning point from that is it makes you think about those different things. Uh, narrative superimposed on games, well, that's from Hobby Space. Random events, black swans, well, yeah, those have been around forever, haven't they? Roll the random events. Uh, counters which have values on which the combat table. Uh, so, what you do is you have a big counter, say you have a value of five on there. And that means it's a 50% chance of hitting. So part of the rules are actually on the individual unit counters. Uh, well, that probably came from decision games like Red Dragon Rising, they have it. I'm sure you can think of other examples. Would anyone like to shout out any random examples? Well, that last one has a direct ring across to the US Marine Corps Assassin's Mate. Yes. Because that's exactly how they run it. So the counters have the dice you can use depending on the type of unit, and it, it, the rules are on the counter, basically. Yes, uh, a clever idea. So, now, you've got to be careful with talking about the subject, because hobby games can induce errors into the professional. Uh, for example, war game conventions like hexes, zones of control, CRTs, etc., they pose a barrier to understanding or immersion for non war gamers because we're all immersed in them. We all know what a ZOC is, but a non war gamer looks at it and thinks, well, what, what's a zone of control? What does it actually mean in military terms? You've got a brigade here. How, what's a zone of control? What is it, zone of control? Um, you've got a ship. What's a zone of control at sea? Um, emphasizing fairness, balance forces, of course, equal ability to control units, decisive games. A lot of war is indecisive, but our games, we tend to expect there to be a conclusion in a reasonable period of time. Not necessarily. So yesterday, in this very spot, I was playing a game by the jury, Algeria, uh, counterinsurgency, and I think indecisive is the only way I can describe the outcome of that game, isn't it? Uh, we catch a few people, shoot a few people, but largely they infiltrate away. But a lot of our games, we expect balance forces, uh, equal ability to control units, that people see it as unfair if they can control their units the way they want to. Prior to the fun over realism, now one of the things is a little bit is increased weapon effects for more eventful, shorter games. So in virtual battle space, for example, which is a first person shooter, I think the weapon effects have been increased maybe 10 times, maybe 100 times, because actually most soldiers would fire 80 shots or 100 shots at a target through a 400 meters away and probably wouldn't hit it in the combat conditions. But in VBS, you probably would. Uh, now, there are various norms which we have in wargaming, which we've just adopted and we use, and they may or may not be supported by research. Uh, terrain effects. Like, what's the effect on urban terrain? Does it just increase casualties? Does it increase or decrease rates of advance? Well, a lot of our assumptions are if you're in urban terrain, defensive strength is twice, um, may not be supported by reality. Um, but there is research into this area by individuals and organisations. Uh, John, I think you're right in that a lot of hobby games have include these pictures, but I'm not sure all this is from the thinking men um, that, that, that have taken things far beyond that. Absolutely, yes. So, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a development picture. Yes. Wargaming is driven forward by the scale of the hobby. If you do something really clever which the market likes, you can make some money out of this, or maybe just fame and glory. Is what you're seeking within the very tiny world of professional and hobby wargaming. But market forces are driving this forward very quickly. Uh, there is 
research going on at the moment. I've got four PhD students, King's College London have five. So there is now real hardcore academic research considering wargaming. And they are looking at causes of errors in professional wargaming. Um, gosh, that's going to upset a few people. Techniques from hobby wargaming that reduce errors in professional gaming. Uh, or new techniques from hobby games, so how can we take them over into the professional arena? There have been some studies on this in the past. For example, a well-known organization think tank based in Washington did a really exciting study which compared uh, the war game, predicted war game effects of various weapon systems, their actual performance in war against the sales brochures. It was so embarrassing, it is classified at a stratospheric level, this study, and that was from the 1980s, by the way. So not everyone is interested in examining professional wargaming, putting it under the academic microscope, the operational analyst microscope. Well, I hope you found that was interesting, but to me, professional wargaming is largely driven forward by hobby wargaming. It's an obvious for everyone to say, everyone to see, but professional wargaming is reluctant to admit it. Yeah. Now, has anyone got any questions or has anyone got any thoughts or comments? 